Hi, and welcome everybody. I'm James Barron, and um, I'm very excited to have Joseph Antonucci Bescher here today for a conversation on Beverly Pepper, who is a very dear friend, longtime acquaintance of Joseph's. Uh, a brief introduction, uh, Joseph is the director of the Snipe Museum of Art at Notre Dame. He's also a professor of art history. Uh, he was the founding director and curator of the Frederick Mayer Gardens and Sculpture Park in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he curated a really important exhibition on Beverly's work called Beverly Pepper um, Pelagenesis <laughs> 1962 through 2012. He's curated major exhibitions on artists such as August Rodin, Jenny Holzer, uh, Henry Moore, Ai Weiwei, Magdalena Abakanovich, and Alexander Calder, in addition, in addition to many books. Uh, Joseph, welcome. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. Well, this is very exciting. Um, I know we've been involved when you um, acquired for the museum the early Beverly Pepper masterpiece, Cardinal. And that was the second piece that you got for the museum. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, we had, well, actually it went the other way. We got Cardinal first and then the uh, outdoor piece came uh, second. So we'll have a uh, very early Beverly uh, inside in the new museum we're building. And uh, we'll have one of her final pieces uh, just outside. So our personal agreement is I come to the opening of the museum and then we go to a football game. Is that right? Okay, there you go. Okay, good. Um, what's the reaction been on the campus to the outdoor piece? Um, well, is it? Yeah, the outdoor piece isn't placed yet because uh, it's a construction site, and so um, we're we're waiting. But uh, people have really been taken with uh, Cardinal. Um, we, although we were um, looking at a sunset of the current uh, spaces, we did a redesign to accommodate that piece and. Um, People have really um, taken to the work and Beverly's uh, uh, biography, and I think um, given us um, given us some great opportunities uh, to move forward. Now, when was the first time you saw Cardinal, and when is the first time you met Beverly? And can you describe your friendship with her, please? Yeah. So. Um, I knew of uh, Beverly um, in the late 80s, early 90s when I was a student um, in Italy. And, um, you know, although I was studying historical chapters, I had always been interested in contemporary uh, art. And, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion because that circle was not very large, especially in central uh, Italy when you got outside of uh, Rome or Milan. <clears throat> And um, we had some mutual friends uh, through the Gori Foundation, which is just outside of Florence. Um, and if you've never been, I would highly, highly recommend it. And um, they uh, gave me the introduction to Beverly. And so this would have been um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And um, I was there working on another project. And uh, she invited my family and I for lunch. So it was um, my wife and I and uh, two little boys. And um, it was the beginning of a really uh, special, very important uh, relationship. And it was on that trip that I saw Cardinal. Um, it was uh, always in her she had a very large kitchen dining hub of house center of the universe uh, room. And um, it was the only piece really that she had out and had kept her entire career. It's such a phenomenal piece. As I recall, you'd walk in the doorway and it was to the right and it had the kind of a totemic presence. Um, can you talk? Well, first let's look at the, this first slide is of our exhibition at the gallery. We have an exhibition Beautiful. of our time. We're very proud of this exhibition. We'll be talking about it a bit in addition to Beverly in general. The next slide, please. Mm. Ah, well, so 1960 is really when um, she goes to Anger Watt. She, as she famously said, she went as a painter and left as a sculptor. But what an audacious, almost miraculous piece to, to make right out of the blocks. Um, do you want to talk about this piece a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that's so extraordinary about Beverly 
um, is um, when you look at her early biography and then you look at the trajectory of her uh, career as a sculpture, because, you know, it sort of went like this and then went like this. And, you know, she went to Pratt, um, you know, she wanted to study uh, industrial design, but uh, that coursework was not open to uh, women at the period. And she found herself uh, studying design in the broader sense and um, had a very interesting early career um, as an art director. Got very bored, um, understood that there were opportunities in post-war Paris for artists to come and to work and study um, both at some of the uh, ateliers of well-known artists and teachers, but also some things related to the academy. And she had a very successful uh, early career as a figurative uh, painter. She um, uh, showed in Rome, it's where she met Bill Pepper, um, um, who she married and had a very uh, wonderful uh, lifelong uh, relationship. And um, it was after that success that she finds herself uh, wanting to travel. She spends a lot of time in Southeast Asia. Her young daughter, Jory, was uh, with her. And you know the experiences at Angkor Wat, the experiences of uh, thinking about things in a new way uh, in terms of the figure receding and the formal uh, components of abstraction uh, stepping forward <clears throat> really sat very strongly uh, with her. She comes home, uh, they were living in Rome at the time. Um, Bill was a, a, a writer and editor and um, uh, was basically stationed in Rome. And there was a courtyard full of trees that had been taken down. And basically Beverly started to carve um, without uh, uh, formal training. And um, this piece, Cardinal, some of those other uh, early wood pieces are part of that. And you're correct. Uh, she did leave uh, Europe as a figurative painter, and she came back uh, about to be born as an abstract sculptor. We should mention also that um, it was a very unusual thing to do with Jory. She took her out of school for nine months. And when they got to Angkor Wat, from what I understand, she was so taken by the banyan tree roots over the um, archaic uh, ruins that they stayed for three months. It just flabbergasted her. Don't you think this was something of a theme throughout her work, this idea of civilization being subsumed by nature and what survives? Yeah, I think that's a part. I think the bigger theme is um, uh, the, the larger arc of time and timelessness. Because whereas what she saw on that trip uh, was so very important, you know, her experiences living in Rome and dealing with classical antiquity, you know, Trajan's column, uh, um, dealing with, you know, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Baths, you know, when she lives and works in central Italy, dealing with the towers of San Gimignano, you know, dealing with the medieval constructions in her beloved Todi or in Siena and so on and so forth. Um, it was about a, a constant uh, relationship um, with time. And the one thing that stands out, even when she was working on a more intimate scale, was what connects this notion of what she saw in Angkor Wat, what she might have experienced in Rome, what she would have experienced in Umbria, is monumentality. She was a sculptor from the very beginning, and I get it uh, uh, even in this image here. She was an artist where monumentality uh, was quite significant, and it was a part of her soul, and it was a part of her work, whether she was truly working on something that was measurably large or something that was more intimate and felt large. Next slide, please. Oh, here we are in Angkor Wat. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's the um, uh, the freedom of the organic that uh, is here as well. And so when you look at these uh, roots and you see the way that they twist and they turn and they move, they have um, 
a seeming sort of freeform quality to them. Although there's a structure there, there's a sort of freeform quality and um, it would inform the way she would start to draw. Her drawings at this time period were absolutely uh, extraordinary and influential, but it also um, uh, informed some of the first things that she would start to weld uh, in just a little bit in the early 1960s. It's also quite interesting, Maria was pointing this out, um, that the sculpture that we just saw is hanging, and here we have these hanging banyan tree roots. Uh, there's a certain weightless quality to both of them. Absolutely. Next, next slide, please. Oh, uh, wow. These are great. Yeah. I mean, would you want to talk a little bit about her personality? I mean, she had a lot of spit and fire, right? Uh, yeah, Beverly was uh, extraordinary. You know, she was the real deal. And um, I don't know that I have ever, nor will I ever meet anybody quite uh, like her. And I think about her all the time. Um, she was honest. She was um, brilliant on so many different levels. Um, she had a huge heart, but she didn't suffer fools. Um, she really knew um, when to be there. And um, she knew when she was with you that um, you were uh, significant to her life and she made you feel um, um, important and needed and wanted. Um, she um, was much more than just an artist. I mean, she was an artist, she was a sculptor, you know, she would say that first and foremost. But um, she was also uh, in uh, incredible, incredible cook, chef, um, you know, throughout her life. And it was sort of a mainstay to her uh, early life. Um, she uh, was able to have conversations with just about anyone. And on so many topics, um, she was very much aware of uh, what was happening uh, in the United States, even though she spent much of her adult life um, in Italy. She was very concerned about um, the state of politics, uh, the state of the environment. Um, she was um, multidimensional and she was, if I can use a phrase that in some circles doesn't fly anymore, I mean, she was a woman and um, she would chafe uh, if you would say woman sculptor, because she saw herself, you know, that is not being an adjective. She was a sculptor, period. But uh, she was also very much um, uh, aware of who she was as um, a being. She was not religious, but at some level, she was very deeply uh, spiritual. Um, and I think that that goes, um, hand in hand with some of the earlier comments that I made about her concern for history. Don't you think also that for a lot of the American artists who spent decades in Rome, that they would look at various aspects of Italian art and that would become something of their spiritual core, almost their, almost their religion. Um, with Beverly, I often felt that it was um, Etruscan art, but also she was looking at all the art around her Sure. I think within um, an hour and a half drive, you could see Piero della Francesca, Frangelico, you could see everything you'd want, Pantormo. Right. And to be able to draw from that, um, I think there's a very interesting thing that happens to Americans who spend a long time in Italy. Don't you think you want to talk about that in relation to Beverly a bit? Yeah, you know, there was... Uh... Uh, very much, um, especially in the 1950s and 1960s, this um, this energy um, around being in uh, Italy, being in in Rome. You know, we're all aware of the phenomenon of La Dolce Vita. Whether you participated in it or not, there was an energy of vibrancy, uh, a sense of life. You know, an openness to um, possibility. But she was also very much aware of what was going on in America and um, really did, you know, prior to the internet, prior to cable television, you know, so and so forth, she did stay very much aware of what was uh, going on. And in those periods when she was uh, in the United States, uh, incredibly well connected and well versed in terms of what was happening um, in the art world. So it was a balancing um, act, you know, anybody who was anybody 
um, for decades that went to Italy in the art and culture world, um, spent time or wanted to spend time with uh, Beverly and Bill um, to, to um, revel in the unique circumstances of a very special uh, household full of ideas, full of artwork, um, full of uh, uh, independence and full of potential. Uh, they were quite a couple. Um, from what I understand, Bill had wanted to report on the war and the Times, I believe it was the Times said, we've already got a correspondent, but I believe he rode a bicycle from Paris yes. down to Rome and that he reported on what he saw and he that he had such a gift that then he had a job. Is that right? It is. And he was a fantastic, fantastic uh, writer. And um, one of the things that Bill did best and then eventually led to his um, career uh, doing biographies was um, to sort of uh, develop a very sincere uh, relationship with his uh, subjects, whether it was somebody that was a famous scientist or doctor or whether it was, um, you know, Giacomo Manzu and John the 23rd or whatever, he had ability to um, to, to reach and, and, and address the soul of his uh, subjects. And I think that that, um, that made him a real standout. The first time that Jeanette and I went over to meet them, we went to the castle in the studio and we were gonna go out to this fabulous restaurant called Umbria, you know, with this beautiful um, view. view. It was winter, it was about Christmas time. And um, Bill said, um, do you wanna have a good conversation? We said, yeah, and he said, okay, well, you've got a two and a half year old daughter. Here's what we're gonna do. We do this with our kids too. He put two chairs next to this beautiful roaring fire. He said, we're gonna take this blanket, put it on here. James, you're gonna stand up and rock your daughter, Isabel, until she falls asleep. We're gonna lay her down here and she's gonna love the sensation of the warmth. And we're gonna have exactly two hours to speak. And that's exactly what happened. And beautiful. during that two hours, I felt so, enthralled with this new friendship. I'm sure you did, I'm sure many people did. They were scintillating in their intellect, their heart, their sincerity. Anyway, next slide, please. Another piece in our show. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so from the wood um, uh, and, and those early um, opportunities where she was really finding a voice. And what's amazing going back to the first hanging piece is how quickly she found a mature voice. Um, it wasn't uh, hesitating. Um, you know, she began to work in steel. And, um, you know, this is a little bit different than the trajectory of most um, 20th century artists that work in, in steel, you know, she actually had to go and find someone. She had to find a blacksmith that uh, taught her how to weld and how to forge and how to bend and turn and understand, you know, how to tack, um, understand, you know, how to bend pressure points and so on and so forth. And as with everything, Beverly was a very quick study. So it was um, from a very um, utilitarian tradition that she began to work with uh, steel. But in retrospect, you know, the same thing happened with David Smith. You know, David Smith uh, uh, worked in steel as a part of the war effort and foundries and factories. Um, Marty Suvero, when he came to New York, you know, was working construction sites and so on and so forth. So this is long before, you know, steel sculpture was taught uh, in art school. You learned it on the street, you learned it on the ground. And, um, you know, if you look at what is shared in these uh, elements here, they both have this incredible celebration of the organic. They both have this um, sort of uh, defying quality of materials. You know, you can't make wood do that. Yes, I can. You can't make steel do that. Yes, I can. But then you have this kind of uh, uh, conversation um, with uh, the two. They're in a conversation uh, themselves. Um, what we bring to it is kind of the, the third party. This is a really brilliant um, uh, early uh, and insightful work. This is a this is a, a connoisseur's piece. We should mention also that um, just for our audience that the wood was uh, done in 1960. So this piece is dated 60 through 63. In between that time in 1962, she goes to Spoleto 
at the invitation of Carandante for the uh, Festival of Two Worlds, she meets right. David Smith and they become instant friends, instant uh, pals going around at night and amazing stories that Beverly told me and I'm sure he told you about how, um, and it's actually in this new book by Michael Branson on David Smith, an 850 page biography about how they went out drinking and Smith had all these drawings and the next morning he said, you know, where's that portfolio of drawings? And she said, don't you remember? You gave them to all the uh, the police. <laughs> they were having um, breakfast with us after our night. You gave them all away. He's like, oh God, I forgot. Yeah. Um, what a character. Next slide, please. Well, you know, their relationship was also very interesting because, you know, he could help her uh, with the translation of many of her ideas into metal. She was absolutely essential in terms of his translating into Italian. You know, he would call her up and say, how do you say this? How do you do this? And so on and so forth. And um, the relationship with these sculptors, and Beverly was the only female in that group, the relationship with these sculptors being placed um, in, in, in factories around Italy was really quite a daring experiment for the early 1960s. And it is also remarkable, and you think she starts making sculpture in 1960, and then in 62, she's invited by Carandante to Spoleto, and then she makes this remarkable, huge piece yeah, um, the Icarus. Which is exactly, and it's still in the town. Yeah. So, um, you know, here's another piece from the early 60s with the wood. It's hard to really tell from this photograph, but it's like, um, it looks very much like the banyan tree roots in the middle with this um, bronze. Um, also, the bases are really interesting that she chose. The last one, it's almost like she just carved into it, you know, to, to rough it up. Um, Joseph, she had said to me once that she liked the idea that her sculptures would appear as if they were unearthed and one wouldn't know what time period they were from. Isn't sure. that an amazing idea? Well, I think it gets back to this bigger picture in her, in her being of connecting with different time periods, different cultures, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, she spoke of base vocabulary that didn't necessarily um, didn't necessarily need to be forced into the dialect of oh this is Etruscan or this is medieval or this is this or that you know it just was a base uh, a base uh, vocabulary and you know you see these things and I know we'll get to them in a little bit but it's interesting you know the next grouping is all around those highly polished you know mirrored uh, surfaces and. You know, although they seem so different from one another, they actually have an awful lot in common. Let's look at some of those. Uh, next, please. So oh, here's this is great. Lava from 61. Yeah. And this is a piece which either can rest on the floor or it can be suspended from a wall. Um, and again, that writing in space. It seems as though her dialogue with David Smith was extremely important. Next, please. Yeah, there you go. You and her show. The one on the left is called Memories. So this is the type that we'll be getting into from the late 60s. Next. Yet one more from 61, 62. Again, next. A view from our show. So we have uh, an assemblage of works from all periods on the right on the various pedestals. Next. Wow, incredible piece from 62. Next. Mm. Wow. So Menorah from 63. Joseph right. is really interesting because um, uh, we had the daughter of um, one of the art writers in our area and she came in and she said, why are there only seven candles? Which was really interesting because the Menorah normally has a shamash in the middle, four on the right, four on the left. And um, we had to do a little bit of research, but it's about Beverly had decided on the seven candle menorah is the ancient symbol of eternity in Judaism. Mm. Uh, I was asking Jory, you know, she wasn't like a strictly observant religious Jew. Not at all. No. Um, but but she did but she did I she did identify as being being Jewish. Right. Which is interesting. I mean there's a big group of Jews out there who who feel that way, who don't go to synagogue very often if at all but do identify as an eth ethnicity. But this is quite a beautiful piece. And um, 
I couldn't remember, you know, Hebrew, but it basically is blessed are though, you know, being written there, Baruch Atoy. Um, next, please. If and there's a, there's a large, this is very similar to um, the large uh, scale piece that she did in Israel from the same time period. Exactly. Um, I'm not sure if we put a picture of that, but it's worth mentioning that for those out there to look at it, um, this piece called Torch looks very much like an eternal flame that would go over the um, ark in a synagogue. I have no idea if it's part of the whole um, evolution of the menorah. But again, that great writing in space. Next, please. Oh, here we go. So this is what you're talking about uh, in 1968. Would you like to describe this change in her work? Yeah, so, you know, you have this, um, this uh, intense period of development in the early 1960s, you know, carving briefly in wood, then the metal, and then um, doing some experimentation with, uh, with bronze organic forms, you know, you're talking about a notion of, of, of drawing uh, in space, expressing in space. And then you realize um, that the, the, the artist needs to continue to develop. And um, one of the things that was really impacting her was the relationship of her sculpture to the environment. The relationship of the uh, sculpture, when it's possible, to the out of doors. And I think Spoleto was very instrumental in terms of her understanding uh, a form in space and the way in which you can move around things, but also the way in which light, um, rain, sleet, snow, the environment affects a piece. And those um, really helped to um, further um, these more minimalist uh, pieces uh, from the mid uh, late 1960s. And she actually had a really significant show of these works in, in Venice. Uh, where light and atmosphere and the environment is so very uh, important. And although there's a, there's a crispness to it, there's a cleanness to it, there's um, a cubic quality to the work, it still is an artist that's um, uh, really working very hard with and through materials. You know, to do uh, in, in, in stainless steel, um, what she's doing here is really quite extraordinary. And um, these pieces not only kind of connect with the environment and connect with their surroundings and are very much about uh, materials, but they are extraordinarily brilliant designs. You know, the, the thing that sometimes we forget to celebrate in Beverly is that she had this incredible sense of design. You know, the, the tilt, you know, millimeters matter. Um, the composition in terms of the way that things arc but don't, the tension, you know, where things are trying to settle in, um, but they're still sort of uh, in, in at least the illusion of a perpetual uh, sense of movement is very much uh, here. Um, you know, the Hirschhorn has two large scale uh, brilliant uh, pieces. One is not um, on display and one um, is out in the sculpture courtyard. And, and, and you know, you see this celebration of, of Beverly uh, so strong there and here, great piece. Don't you think also that gravity is a central element in the work? Well, this piece seems to almost, the cubes could be floating off into space. They could also be tumbling down. So it's an ascension and a descension at the same time, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, and she's finding her own way, you know, she's finding her own way, you know, this is um, uh, 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 in a moment where um, um, David Smith has, you know, uh, conquered uh, stainless, but in a different way, she has to work. This is a moment when um, uh, other artists, the minimalists are uh, working forward, but she's doing it in her own way. We should mention also David Smith, died in 1965. It hit those around him who loved him very hard. Helen right. Frank, Robert Motherwell, Beverly, everyone. I'm always intrigued when an artist dies, how other artists carry the baton forward. So, you know, she starts working with stainless. It looks a little bit like Smith, but as we'll see in uh, some of the other slides, she makes it her own. As you've also described, her work, 
um, it dissolves into nature in a way that Smith's did not. His had more of a monumentality and certainly a masculinity to it that Beverly's did not. Yeah. And, you know, in their own way, um, the their own way, the manner in which these engage um, with the environment, when they engage with light and air and space and so on and so forth, you know, this really helps uh, further what will come um, in the not too distant future. And that's her land art. Um, you know, those things where she's actually physically engaging with uh, the land, you know, they've got roots, they've got origins here. I'd like to mention also this sculpture is in the setting of the gallery. One of the great advantages that we have in Kent, Connecticut, as opposed to a major city like New York, is that we put the sculptures outdoors in nature and we see how they evolve during the day under different light conditions with you know, extreme light and shadow with foggy days. It's uh, a beautiful thing. Joseph, I'm sure you feel this, but I feel her presence when I look at her work. It's almost like I hear her voice, that deep chortle, that laugh where she kind of tilt her head and cock her eye. Um, don't you feel that with the sculptures that you have around you as well? I do. You know, she was very much uh, uh, one with, with her work. And um, although the voice uh, changes, evolves um, over time, um, it still resonates Beverly. Next slide, please. Mm. So here's another one called Torre Pieno no Vuoto, which is literally the tower that's full yet empty. Uh, this was a piece that was in one collection in Rome. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've had a continuation of Having lived in Rome from 2003 to 2014, I still go there about six times a year. I have a small apartment there. And uh, I walked into this home and saw this. It was like, wow, it's been shown super early and it went from the parents to the children. Um, but again, this sense of balance, this precariousness where, uh, and, and the engineering that you're talking about, the design, um, how precocious to have this tower suspended with nothing underneath it. Yeah, this is a fantastic piece. And, you know, um, there's such a strong relationship to um, the sentinels that she makes, the markers that she will uh, make. It's very, very powerful. But that great, great um, masterful sense of design with the two units at the base left and then the void over to the right, um, it's just, uh, it's just, it's just breathtaking, breathtaking. And, you know, the other thing about Beverly's pieces, you know, she, she, she could do something that could be tabletop. She could do something that would be, I'd call this garden scale, although it's not in a garden, or she could do something that was truly, you know, for a public plaza circle. And, and, and they have a certain sameness. I mean, measurably, of course, they're quite different, but they have a certain authenticity that they're related to uh, one another. So I see this and I can imagine it at, you know, tabletop height. I can see this and I can imagine this at three stories. Um, she had such a great sense of design and such a, a gift for uh, monumentality. You're so right about that because sometimes we'll get a sculpture that's related to this and it's 10 or 11 inches tall. But if we put it on a table with the sky and the hill behind it in a certain way, it looks like it would be eight feet tall. And there's exactly. no difference. Next, please. So here's one that is 25 inches tall. This was in the same family, Joseph, in Rome. Yeah. The daughter got this one, the son got the other. Um, uh, some brilliant clients actually bought this. And one of the things that they loved about it was how the black becomes positive, even though that's the void. That seems to be a huge theme in the work. Yeah, this is very similar to the group that was um, uh, exhibited in Venice. And that was a really, really, really significant um, uh, exhibition. Beverly did talk, you know, color is not something that uh, shows up in many of her works. And I think she would probably not ever call herself uh, a colorist, you know. There are other painters, you know, the Calders, the Caros, the De Suvros, um of the world um, that are colorists in a sense. But she knew how to use uh, color 
that was going to be um, not decorative, but uh, serious. And um, even when it's a blue or an orange or something like that, there's a level of seriousness um, to the color. And she's very judicious about how and when color um, is gonna be used. This is a breathtaking piece. Um, and to be only, you know, a couple of feet tall, you know, to me, it says, um, it says big, it says monumental. Right, I totally agree. I mean, that could easily be 60 or 70 inches tall. Um, by the way, that's a Jules Olitsky spray from 1966 behind it and a table from probably the 40s or 50s, probably French, that my wife Jeanette found. Um, and it looks so at home with those two. She showed at Andre Emmerich Gallery for many, Correct. many years, decades, Correct. as did Jules Olitsky. And this group of Olitsky, Caro, Kenneth Nolan, uh, David Smith, this was a, a very tight group. Um, so we were kind of thrilled to have this um, juxtaposition with a 66 spray. Next, please. Mm. Well, uh, Dylan Everett put together this PowerPoint. And I'm very grateful to Dylan, Casey Cross, another gallery director, and Maria Klamis for this, the work they did on this. But what a beautiful thing. You're talking about scale on the left, Perizidis from, you know, 14 inches. And on the right, right, in the studio, that piece has to be about 80 or 90 inches tall and much longer. Um, Joe, do you want to talk about the precariousness of the balance and how also foreboding it is? That's a very sharp point. If you walk around it, you're kind of afraid you get your sweater caught on that thing or poked. Yeah. yeah. So if you, you know, if you pause for a second and think about where we've been and those earlier pieces that were so um, decidedly um, organic and um, the, the, the curve, the, you know, you've referred to it as the notion of the drawing in space, the stainless steel pieces and her venturing into working um, with the land, um, I think gave her pause to, to think about how important geometry um, is. And so what you'll see happening coming out in, but coming out of the stainless steel pieces um, are a whole series of uh, metal pieces wherein geometry becomes so very important, um, the triangle uh, in particular. And one of the things that she realizes is that the triangle going back through the history of art, whether it's the Renaissance or it's uh, ancient Greece has such a powerful role because it says something about momentum. You know, a circle is stable, a square is stable, but the triangle has the potential to move and it does create the illusion of uh, movement. And so I think in this instance, she's really um, dealing with energy um, she dealt with energy before, but this is energy moving uh, forward. It's contained there in that inner triangle, but it's definitely uh, propelling itself uh, to move forward. You know, this also, this reminds me of the great uh, piece that she did um, at uh, um, um, Dartmouth uh, that she did with Jan Vandermark. Um, it also reminds me very much of the piece that she did um, in Dallas for the Nashers, uh, the Land Canal, because um, you know the, the the energy, the momentum of of, of geometry is a, both a part of those pieces. The land is obviously more involved, but um, it's a part of this piece as well. Those are some really brilliant points you're making, and um, we're going to see Dallas Pyramid in the next uh, slide, but. Uh, you know, again, you've got this thing in both of these. This is right um, at the gallery as well. So Dallas Pyramid is at the time of the Nasher Commission. One thing I loved about Beverly, she never forgot her gratitude. She was grateful to Ray and Patsy Nasher throughout her entire career. Um, as a gallery, we've show at the Dallas Art Fair. And um, she was so glad that Jeremy Strick would come in and bring his trustees. So we always make a special effort in Dallas as a sort of homage to the Nashers. But um, so here we're talking about, again, this type of momentum that you're talking about, the movement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to elaborate about Dallas Pyramid a bit? Well, you know, I think that um, the thing that most, um, that moves me the most in this piece is the planar quality 
and how it's a part of the land. And then all of a sudden there's this trajectory, you know. Um, so she's acknowledging being earthbound and being of a place and so on and so forth. But she's also connecting at some level with the, the infinite. Um, and um, you know, not a lot of artists can do this. It's up and down or it's side to side, but to actually go across and then up and then beyond is really great. And although the, 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 the sensation of the infinite is very easy to understand with the point that goes up and into space. The connection with the infinite is also there with the ground because where does it stop? You know, her physical form, yes, is measurable, but really she is pulling you out and into the ground or maybe conversely, she's pulling the ground up and um, into uh, the work. Um, I've had the good fortune of seeing this piece um, in a couple of different locations and um, I'm struck by it uh, every time. And I'm also really moved by the materials. Um, you know, Beverly worked in a variety of materials, um, very successful in a variety of materials, but there's just something about when she's working with steel um, that, that um, moves me um, in a certain way because it's um, industrial and it's of a time, but it's also uh, timeless. It gets back to that timelessness that you had suggested uh, early on. No, amazing your, descri piece. your description of this piece is amazing. And of course it's informed because you included it in your major retrospective of her work and you could see it every day, which really changes the understanding. Next yeah. slide. So I think we've spoken a bit about these, so maybe we'll move forward. Yeah, and, and I, I will just say that, you know, these pieces, um, you know, Beverly had a few of these um, throughout her life um, in, in her house. Um, and the way in which they worked across the land um, should not be underestimated. Um, they are unique. There's not a lot of these, but they're very, very uh, special. And um, the way in which uh, they connect earth and sky, brilliant, brilliant. The Not a lot of these. Is, uh, the next one is called Campo Semp. And here we actually see the trees, the sky, the clouds being reflected. Um, it's this idea that she lets the piece evaporate into nature. And it feels almost like the piece is ready to lie down and go to sleep. And then it wakes up and a piece flips upward. Next, please. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, what a, what a woman, oh my God. I also love that she didn't want to be considered a woman artist. She just wanted to be considered an artist. An artist, yeah. But, you know, she also wanted to be considered a woman. Yeah. You know, um, she um, recognized, you know, the, the, the power of her gender. She recognized the uh, significance of, um, of, her, of her being. Um, but you know, to use one as the descriptive of another um, just didn't sit well with her. I love that about her. Yeah, yeah, I love the image of the right. Here's another small piece, which um, you know, this is two and a half inches high, 19 inches wide. Yeah. But you know, if we had it in a different setting without that red table, um, you could almost imagine it's as big as Campo Semp. It has that, and that's that point that you're making that she's so grand on every scale from small, yeah. medium to very large. You know, and here is just, you know, if I was teaching a design class, you know, here was where I would show an image and I would say, look at the relationship of these three elements. You know, what would happen if you moved it a couple of inches, any one of those to the left, to the right, you know, pushed it forward. You know, Beverly had this amazing sense of design and her eye, could latch onto things that most people wouldn't necessarily pick up on, but for her, millimeters uh, matter. You know, I, had the, I mean, she was she was well into her uh, 80s, and we were at the foundry together. And um, I have images somewhere um, of her, you know, giving the guys on the foundry floor what floor what for because things were just you know an uh, inch, you know, two inches at the very most uh, off. And you know she got right up on top of the work, and she was showing them just how important uh, space was and how important the design was, right down to the absolute detail. 
there's an incredible video that Jory had posted on Instagram of her mother with a broken arm doing a drawing and studying it and creating out of this very simple uh, circular shape, how she's gonna get the feeling of lift, how she highlights the inside and the outside of these forms. Right. Another mm. one, yeah. yeah. Next. And then she goes, you know, from stainless. Here's, a, yeah. this is a series that we have in the gallery. We have four of them here. The yeah. web from 1977. These had been maintained at her Sharon, Connecticut home, and uh, we had them conserved. And they're really quite remarkable in nature again. And you know, the interesting piece for me is that this is another um, lesser known app, uh, 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 part of her career. Um, but these web pieces, um, they have a relationship to her prints, they have a relationship to her drawings and so on and so forth. But, you know, Beverly was someone that, that, that needed to keep moving on. And whereas everything that we have seen recently was plainer, everything was about sort of, you know, flat elements being given new life or the planes of geometry. This is, this is about sort of breaking that down and dealing with contour and dealing uh, with structure in a new way. For me, this interlude is really um, Beverly challenging herself. Right. Let's uh, move through a bit so we can get to some of the later work in our Zoom here. Another uh, picture of Beverly in the studio. Um, this is another installation view at the gallery. I think we've covered these. These are some of the pieces, these, uh, you know, great portals, you know, Janio portal and these various others. Next, please. Yeah. And we forget sometimes, you know, that many of these things were um, inspired by her love of tools. Um, you know, things came and, you know, she would pick it up and she would study it and, you know, the design hit her, um, you know, factor in um, the opportunity that she had to work at John Deere, you know, factor in, you know, the kind of tools that uh, she inherited and factor in this basic notion of, and then here she shares a lot with uh, other very significant sculptors of her generation, this notion of uh, work, working with your hands, you know, for being um, um, a petite uh, individual and, um, um, you know, being very much aware of wanting to present herself properly and so on and so forth. You know, Beverly had the most amazing hands um, you know, they were, they were um, um, worn by time and work and um, they, were, they were thicker than you would imagine just from the muscles, uh, not just carving or welding, but also years and years and years of, of drawing. And, you know, this idea of hands and tools, tools and hands, um, and that we go back all the way through history. We go back to prehistory and tools um, are so essential to the human experience. You know, this is in some ways what's going on right here. It's also interesting. She really knew when to stop in the work. Uh, this was a, a great trait and you see it all through the work. The next yeah. slide. Milton's Wedge, wow. The this wedge, piece yeah. is on view at the Aldrich Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, they're picking up in January, uh, right after our show ends. And interestingly, they wanted the base, which is a base that we designed really for Beverly's work. This is a uh, cedar, which um, I had milled and we wanted to create kind of a, a rough base. Sometimes I like her work more on wood than I do even on like a white painted base. Yeah, Next. yeah the wedges are fabulous. Here's uh, another piece, which we um, just moved to this setting. So we have sort of a deep valley view, Pietro Santa presence, and talk about something looking like a tool. Uh, Joe, this is exactly what you're talking about here. It's a file, you know. It's, uh, like. it's that, but it, but you know, it for me, I look at this and I see the uh, prehistoric, I see the Etruscan, I see uh, Giacometti's uh, women, um, you know. 
all very, very, very seemingly different, but all have a level of seriousness, all have a level of respect uh, for form, all have a level of respect for uh, uh, material. Um, this is this is great. You know, Beverly did a lot of these upright forms um, in the 80s, uh, in the early 90s. And although they're siblings, um, they all have their individuality. This is a really brilliant piece. Next, please. You were talking about San, Gim San Gimignano earlier um, <laughs> and the towers. I, you were also talking about Giacometti. Yeah. Now, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is how she continued with wood throughout sculptures uh, for many years. So this piece is from 86 through 89. It's got these exotic, very, very hard woods, uh, mahogany incorporated with found elements and elements that she uh, created out of steel. Yeah. You know, we celebrate her for industrial materials. Um, you know, that's gonna be in the first sentence of the biography, um, but you know, she did have a relationship with many different materials. Um, she, she appreciated the rigorous challenge that um, Stone provided her. Um, she appreciated um, the, um, the inherent sensibilities of uh, working with uh, with wood. She was, an, as an artist, very respectful of materials. And, um, you know, it comes out uh, here as well. Did she ever speak with you about Calder? Because the shapes at the bottom of these two um, column-like pieces feels very much like Calder, very yeah. early, on, late 30s. Yeah. Early. Well, the artist that, that we, we did talk about uh, uh, Calder, but you know, most frequently it was in association with um, 1962 and Spoleto because he was obviously the big gun in that um, in that show. Um, the artist that she really found um, wood pieces and assemblage pieces to be um, quite moving was Picasso. And she talked about um, um, one Picasso show in Paris that she saw um, early-ish on where he was using wood and he was using found objects and so on and so forth. And that really, um, that really got uh, into her being. Um, very, very different artists and so on and so forth. But um, some of the things that Picasso was doing with materials and his sense of, um, his sense of um, form, um, th th that was important to Beverly. We should mention that if somebody wants to go to Spoleto, there's still a great room of her sculpture there. And if they take the train, they'll see this enormous Calder stable outside of the train station, which is right. just majestic. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. How fabulous. So we have the sculpture on the left in our exhibition. Right. The San altars are now uh, really framing the beginning, if you start in the town of Todi, of this ambling walk down the hill to uh, the Bramante Church. And you have various vistas and various sculptures. That's quite a moving experience to see. And how ingenious of her, I think it's 22 sculptures, to have thought about this. And I don't know, did she talk to you about the benches, the need of the benches for her sculpture? Sorry. She did, and she, you know, it was one of the things that she was working on in the last uh, years of, of her life. You know, the park was very important to her. Um, you know, as an artist who was of the world, she was also very much of Todi. Um, you know, what that place um, became over the course of her life and um, what she was able to contribute, which, you know, for a place of great history and length is not always so easy to think about. Um, the park and the work of uh, uh, her team, um, really a labor of love, love of place, love of people, um, love of um, ideas. And for an area where history is so important, you know, how do you make a contribution to history? And, you know, these are some of the works that I think are that great celebration of history because they are at once of the past, of the present. They are at once, you know, uh, pagan, but Christian, you know, um, they are memorials, they're celebrations and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, these are really uh, fantastic pieces. 
I should mention also these San Martino altars were really flanking her driveway in Sharon, Connecticut. And then she had, you know, the wherewithal to think that they would be such a kind of a tremendous gateway towards the journey of her sculpture garden. So um, they frame it really beautifully. I know that the benches were so important to her and I like the idea that she could think of the people of the town sitting down and having a gelato on a Friday evening and looking at maybe kids playing around the sculptures, uh, that she was so of the people, I think was really remarkable. And, and, and the, the, you know, the, she thought about the whole experience, you know, she was interested in the whole uh, experience and that, you know, all of the voices mattered, you know, so the material on which something was going to be placed, you know, go back to the piece that you showed very early that it was a stone base and, you know, other materials on top. What's the relationship of what the sculpture is going to be on to the environment? She's very concerned about how things were going to look, you know, what were the lamps going to be like, you know, that were going to be, it's a very complete uh, visual experience for her. Next, please. This is outside the front of our gallery, these two amazing Bedford columns, again, related to the San Martino altars. Wonderful. Right? Next, please. So uh, this is a tabletop version of a piece which, yeah. as you know, Joe, stood outside her front doorway, a 22 foot version of Longo monolith, which was acquired by the US consulate in Milan. They're building a new campus and I love that they bought this piece and it's gonna be the centerpiece of uh, their campus. They said, the idea is it's like a human hand, which is welcoming you, yeah. but like America, the back of it is don't screw with us because we're strong, we have a backbone. Yeah. And I think that's very much like Beverly when you really think about it. She could be yeah. so embracing, but you didn't cross the line with her. She wasn't the type who you like, you know, were able to um, transcend into bad manners with her and you know look at what we're having here you know we're we're in some ways starting not quite almost but we're starting to come full circle so you start out with uh those early pieces that you shared with us today and the curvilinear the organic um is so pronounced and you have then at the end of her life, you know, 50, 60 years later, the curves coming back in. Um, it's, 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 it hasn't been fully released yet, but you can see in this piece and some sibling pieces to this, there's a fabulous piece uh, that's in front of the Dallas Art Museum uh, uh, like this. And you can see that, that the, the strictness of geometry has, uh, uh, or the totemic um, is starting to flex itself with a more curvilinear language once again. And again, you've got that positive negative. You've got this beautiful slit right down the middle. Which is the positive, which is the negative, which is the mass, which is the void. And I know that was the lifelong pursuit of hers in her sculpture. Right. Next, please. Uh, well, here's one which we, um, this is another vista at the gallery. Yeah. Uh, we had this piece very recently. It's now in a private collection, My Circle. Uh, Joe, do you want to talk about circularity in her work a bit? Well, you know, when we did our show um, and we basically looked at 50 years, um, you know, that's one of the things that we uh, talked about. Um, that's the name of the show, Palin Genesis, you know, coming back to uh, 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 kind of a new beginning. And um, you have here, in some ways, the summary of a lifetime um, of someone who dealt with the monumental, who dealt with the industrial, who had an extraordinary um, sense of uh, design, but using a kind of visual energy that was um, inherent to her early career. And um, I think it's so poetic uh, and so beautiful. Um, I don't know that she would like that second word, but it's so poetic and so beautiful that she, um, she was here in the last years of her life and, and, and working and, um, you know, at the foundry and, you know, in the studio, um, she found, she found uh, a way forward 
with something that was new, but something that was authentic to uh, where she had been. So these circles were exhibited, I can't recall if we have a picture of it in our show, at the uh, Arapaches in Rome. Arapaches, yes. I was living there at the time, and it was the most incredible thing. I would bike over there in the middle of the night. They had these enormous cranes, and then they were lowering these pieces onto the steps and these various kind of levels up to this uh, building by Richard Meyer, this minimalist building. And um, I completely fell in love with these circular pieces. Going there late at night in Rome, you know, with the quiet of Rome at night, this particular sculpture intrigues me because the scale of it reminds me of a Morris Lewis Italian veil. The veils he made in America were much larger. The Italian veils, because they were to be shown at a gallery in Milan, were more classical. They had a more contained kind of combustive energy. Um, and I know Morris Lewis was also showing at Andre Emmerich, but the way her work relates to Lewis, even when you look at the Corten, there are these fabulous drips that come on the, the patina, the way it ages. Um, I don't really have a question, but if you want to comment on that whole no, I, you know, it, it was really um, um, one of my great, uh, you know, professional joys to see her and spend a lot of time with her as she was working um, on this series. I will say that um, they are extremely successful in a variety of contexts. Um, you know, in, in something that's wooded, in something that is uh, urban, um, they, they, they hold their own and it says something about the strength of the work. I've even seen them inside um, and, and they're very successful. Um, next slide, please. Smaller scale. Yeah, wow. smaller scale. But, you know, if you look at the underside or the inside of that inner circle, you know, that concern for texture um, um, should remind people of what we saw very early on in her career. And then that momentum of the arc coming to the point, you know, that's like the pyramids, you know, it's there. Um, it's all here. You know, she is an artist that had different chapters to her career. But if you really sit down in a studied way, you realize that there is a very, very strong line that goes through it all and it's connected. It's such a brilliant point because she called it materia, which is actually applied on top of that lower arc, mm -hmm. but it feels almost like corrosion. So again, it's that timelessness of something that could have been unearthed and maybe one element of it corroded with time. Right. right. Next, please. Another broken circle. Wow. Um, Joe, I want to mention we had two versions of it. And what's so intriguing, they were never an addition. The difference between the two, the way the, the torque within the arcs, they're so different that it was just phenomenal for me to see the two together. And she has that materia again yeah. in these broken arcs, that sense of corrosion, perhaps. Next. Mm. Well, now you can only imagine how much she labored over how to get that upper curve so that it had the maximum torque. So it felt like it was just flicking off into space or curling downward at the same time. Next. Mm. There's another piece. Um, we're so grateful to have this piece, Octavia. That's the Vista, which, um, you know, to me has the feel, feeling almost of Umbria, of Todi. It does. Uh, and I was going down, I saw that um, another arc in nature, the rainbow, and I thought, what a majestic moment. How incredible. But you know, you brought up this point. That piece could be 10 inches tall or it could be 10 feet tall. Yeah. Next, please. Another view of the gallery. Next. Do you want to talk a little bit how she went back in her career to what she had started in 68 through 71 to do these stainless steel pieces, such right. as the Orion in 2016. Yeah, so, you know, in eight, nine, 10, 12, you know, she's going back to the curving forms and so on and so forth. She's primarily working in um, uh, steel, uh, core 10, you know, the oxidized surfaces and so on and so forth, um, iron, iron, very important to her. But I think she had a yearning for um, what, 
um, was a very important moment in her career in the 1960s and um, loved the materiality of um, uh, stainless steel. But I think she was also interested in a very specific challenge with those earlier pieces that are more cubic and more planar and so on and so forth. It's one thing to get the surface of stainless to a certain degree of finish, high polish and so on and so forth when you're dealing with planes. It is a completely different thing that the faint of heart would shy away from immediately to do that with a curving form. So, you know, how do you take that investigation of stainless and move it into this uh, degree of uh, uh, energy? Um, they pulled it off. They really pulled it off. Faint of heart, that could never be a description of Beverly. She right. was so brave and um, loved forward motion um, in her work, in her life. Next, please. Mm -hmm. An expression of a similar idea, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, and ten. Next. Mm -hmm. This is the last Aquarius from 2016. Uh, I'd like to say also that she was not one who was concerned about um, how a piece was going to be received, either by the public or her dealers. Yeah. Um, I love that about her, that, you know, damn it, she was going to make these pieces in stainless steel, no matter what anybody thought. Right. Doesn't that strike you as like the classic late stage of an artist to go back and kind of try to tie it all up together? I think it's classic Beverly. Yeah. Uh, Joe, is there anything else you'd like to add um, to our discussion? Well, you know, I just, I guess that I would, um, I would close and, you know, it's been such a gift. Thank you. Um, you know, as we look forward to Thanksgiving, I was very grateful for this opportunity because it gave me the opportunity to think deeply about somebody uh, that I cared for very deeply and a uh, body of work that I think is absolutely incredible. But, you know, I mean, Beverly was the, she was the, the trifecta. She was the, what really, in my humble opinion, makes for a great artist. Um, she was um, endlessly creative, you know, she was um, um, always challenging herself, but a lot of us are creative. Added to this, she had this incredible sense of design and um, this understanding of uh, form and materials. So that shrinks the audience greatly. And then you add in the third piece of this, her work ethic. She had an extraordinary work ethic. There was no such thing as a day off. There was no such thing as, you know, uh, downtime. She just kept going. You know, any artist that is actively engaged into their late 80s and early 90s and trying to find new ways uh, to continue to do their thing is important. But Beverly's work ethic was over the course of five, six, seven uh, decades. And you put those three things together, the work ethic, the creativity, and the sense of design, and you had somebody that um, was very, very special to the history of art. Well, the gratitude is all ours. Um, I can tell you that within an hour, I've never heard such an eloquent, succinct, and brilliant summary of Beverly Pepper. And um, I'm really grateful for those uh, who attended and also those who will be seeing it, who will be posting this on the James Barron Art site and also on YouTube. So this particular hour will also live forever. And I think that Beverly would have said, Joe, you, you've done me proud here. I think you really were phenomenal. So uh, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. And Look forward to speaking again soon.